Good evening, and welcome to Inside the Hive, the role of honeybees and beekeeping in New Jersey with Gene Miller. This is presented by the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. My name is Elliot Ruga. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. I am joined tonight by my colleague, Dylan Medici, Manager of Outreach and Education. Hi, I'm Dylan Medici. Uh, as Elliot said, I'm a manager of outreach and education here at the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, organization based out of Boot, New Jersey, with a mission to protect the water and other vital natural and cultural resources of the New Jersey Highlands, a region of over 860,000 acres of natural beauty, a diversity of wildlife, farmlands, and history rich built environments, and a 360 square mile, nearly contiguous Highlands core forest in the northern part of New Jersey. The Highlands spans 88 municipalities and parts of seven counties in the northern half of New Jersey. And despite comprising only about 17% of the state's land area, uh, this region provides an abundant clean drinking water supply for 70% of the state's population. The carbon sequestration values of the Highlands mature forests provide New Jersey with its best defense against climate change, and because of the Highlands' plentiful outdoor recreational opportunities, the U.S. Forest Service found that the combined uh, New Jersey and New York Highlands see more visitors each year than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and Grand Canyon National Parks combined. Of the abundant natural resources of the Highlands, our forests have the highest concentration. Pollinators play an essential but underrated role in the health of our native forests. Pollinators are the insects or, or others that transfer pollen grains from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma of the flower, facilitating fertilization and thus reproduction of the species. Plants rely on pollinators such as bees, yet many of these pollinator species are under threat due to habitat elimination through development, logging, and the abundant use of pesticides and herbicides for agriculture, golf courses, suburban and office park lawns. We are pleased to welcome Jean Miller from the Northwest New Jersey Beekeepers Association to talk about the lives of bees in New Jersey and in North America and their vital role as pollinators. What kind of what kind of bees we have in New Jersey, and what are the things that look like bees but are not bees? Jean has been a beekeeper since 2014 and is recognized by Cornell University as a master beekeeper. She is a member of the Northwest New Jersey Beekeepers Association, the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, and the Eastern Apiculture Society. Jean is also a Rutgers University Master Gardener and is considered an expert on native deer-resistant pollinator plants. We encourage you to submit any questions you have for Jean in the Q&A function at the bottom of the taskbar. And after her presentation, uh, she is gonna field questions. Uh, we encourage you to keep things on topic and of course, uh, to enjoy the webinar. We welcome Jean Miller. So Jean, what's the buzz about bees? <laughs> well, let me show you. Thank you very much for having me this evening and for that wonderful um, introduction. So I'm gonna take you inside the hive. I will be telling you about honeybees and beekeeping. Um, and we will touch a little on native bees, but primary, I really have a separate topic, a separate presentation on native bees, but we will we'll address it a, a bit and really, what is um, the, the problems with uh, honeybees and their survival can also be applied to native bees as well. Uh, so let's go inside the hive. All right, first of all, what, what bothers me as a beekeeper is a lot of times people say, oh, I don't like bees, they sting me. I, I get sting, stung by them all the time. And I said, well, are you sure they are honeybees? Or are you sure they're bees in general? Um, a lot of people equate yellow jackets or wasps primarily yellow jack jackets to, to bees. And there really are some major differences. So we'll look at this Venn diagram briefly, <clears throat> and we'll look at some things that they have in common as well as some things they have um, that are, are not in common. So for example, our honeybees are on the uh, left side of the screen and our wasps, yellow jackets, hornets, I kind of combine them are on the right side. 
coloring. Your honeybees, generally, they're not a bright yellow or bright white. They are an amber color, almost the kind of color of honey, uh, striped with like a black or a very dark gray color. Your um, wasps, yellow jackets, and hornets typically are brighter in the fact they have maybe a white or yellow stripes. This is not all of them, but the majority of them. And uh, they are not hairy, hairy but uh, bees are fuzzy. And there's definitely a major reason for that. Uh, but your wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets are pretty much shiny and bald. Both of them, however, do eat nectar. And that's primarily the adults. They eat nectar because that is their uh, carbohydrate fuel for energy. Wasps, yellow jackets, hornets will make an attempt to steal honey from honeybees, especially during the summer dearth. When there's less out there for them to forage, they will, they will attack uh, weakened hives and try to take honey. But also honeybees will also try to steal honey from other hive, other colonies. Uh, stronger ones may attack weaker ones. So they do have that in common. However, the wasps, honeybees, and native bees for that matter, don't make true honey. They, um, excuse me, the wasp, hornets, yellow jackets, native bees, they don't make true honey. Only the honeybee species, the apis species, do make honey. And there are approximately, well, depending on the entomologist, nine to 11 honeybee species in the world. However, we only have one here, the Western honeybee. There are different subspecies of it, um, like Italians and Russians and Carniolans, but there's only one honeybee species, not just in North America, but also South Central America and Europe and Africa, different subspecies, but it's all the Western honeybee. In the winter time, the entire colony of honeybees clusters together to stay warm. That is not the case with your wasps, yellow jackets, and hornets. The, the, only the queen survives the winter and everyone else dies. She overwinters usually um, in leaf litter and then will come out in the spring to start a new colony. So if you ever see those um, bald-faced hornet nests up in trees that look, kind of look like uh, paper mache footballs, there's nothing in them right now. You could cut them down, use them as an indoor decoration if you want to, because everything has died except for the queen, who is now kind of uh, hibernating, let's say, in leaf litter. For all of these insects, only the females can sting. The males, called drones, have no weaponry on them. So if you get stung by something, it's a female, insect-wise. <laughs> when it comes to um, stinging, your wasps, hornets, yellow jackets can sting repeatedly because they have a straight stinger. They do not have little barbs on it. Unlike honeybees, if you get stung by a honeybee, the stinger gets stuck into your skin and her, her stinging pouch gets ripped out of her and she dies. So she only stings once and she dies. Now, native bees, they also can sting repeatedly. And it makes sense because they really are mostly solitary, whereas honeybees live in a colony. All of them have five eyes. You probably can see the two that are most obvious, the compound eyes on each side of the head, but they also have three tiny eyes. We'll probably see that better in, a, in another picture uh, in a triangular fashion, kind of like uh, between those compound eyes. And they are simple eyes or silly, and th um, they are primarily just light, uh, light sensors. Your honeybees are vegetarians. They, the protein in their diet, which is really used to to develop the brood, or um, that's the larvae, and the, the larvae uh, is, is obtained from pollen off of um, plants, flowers. However, your wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, they are omnivores. They eat nectar, just like um, honeybees, but they feed, let's call it insect protein, to their developing young. And that can be in the form of uh, caterpillars, which so really your wasp, hornets, and yellow jackets do fulfill a very important role in the ecosystem. They're the ones that might be uh, keeping control of a lot of the pests that you have in your garden um, by stinging them and using that as their protein. And the wasps, hornets, and yellow jackets, they use items in nature to create their um, homes. It could be like a mud wasp uses mud or, or uh, chewed wood to make the, the paper wasps or the, the, the hornet's nests, or they'll go into holes in the ground. However, honeybees, 
exude wax from their body. They have eight glands on, underneath, on the underside of their abdomen, four on each side, and they little wax flakes can come out of them at, at a certain age of the honeybee's life. And that's what they use to make their house. I just always think that's cool. Wouldn't it be neat that you could have like things come out of your body that makes your house like nails and sheetrock and, and shingles? Well, basically the honeybee does. As I mentioned earlier, it's one sting and she dies. So only the, the, the females are called workers, except for the queen, she's also a female. They're the only ones with the stingers. The female workers have barb stingers. If she stings you, she will die. The queen has a straight stinger. And there is a, well, in essence, it does have tiny weeny barbs on it, but it, it acts like a straight stinger. And there's a very important reason why she has a straight stinger where all the other female workers have a barb stinger. And we'll get into that later. Um, that's what I just mentioned. And But normally, they are very gentle insects. Honeybees, as well as native bees, aren't really going to sting you unless they feel that their nest site is threatened or they feel they are threatened if you swat at them. I often have honeybees and native bees um, a land, a land on me um, when I'm sweating out in the garden and they're just licking my sweat off. And as long as I don't swat at them, they just lick and fly away. Now, uh, all bees including bumblebees, they have, you look, thinks like a tongue, but it's, it's in essence more of a, it's a proboscis. And they use that to lick up honey, nectar, lumps of sugar, but that's not the, that's not going to hurt you. They can lick, lick away at your skin, lick the sweat away. That's soft. It's, it's the other end that you might be concerned about. And as I mentioned earlier, well, the bees, both honey and native, have, a, uh, have, are fuzzy. And the purpose is pretty much to collect your pollen. And uh, in a couple of ways, it's almost like have a fuzzy cat rolling into some sawdust, it'll stick to it. But also as the bees fly, the electrons kind of are shed from their um, hair, which under the microscope is almost feather-like. And um, it, it charges the hair so that when it goes into a, a flower, the pollen is, is there's an electromagnetic uh, attraction and and it, it gets on their their body they even have hair on their eyeballs they're pretty much covered with hair so now there are several stages of development for a honeybee they go through a complete metamorphosis um and here's where you can see the eyeballs the three simple eyeballs simple eyes in the center they have the two uh compound and the three simple ones you can see the three simple ones also on this pupa over here they start out all as eggs, and uh, for honeybees, the egg is an egg for three days only, and it's laid at the bottom of a honeycomb cell. You can see them here, and as a beekeeper, you must be able to see eggs. I need to have reading glasses now to, to see them, but you really need to see eggs to be a successful beekeeper. After three days, they hatch into a larvae, and you can see some white larvae, and it looks like they're swimming in a little pool of, of creamy white substance. That's called royal jelly, which we'll talk to, talk about. And all larvae, doesn't matter if they're going to develop into a queen, a worker, or a drone, that's a male bee, all get this, this soup, bee superfood, let's call it, this royal jelly for the first three days of life. Then they usually get switched over to what's called brood food, which is a combination of honey and pollen unless they're the queen, she will get royal jelly her entire life. After about roughly six days as a larvae and their, their eating machines are kind of like caterpillars in this, in this stage, um, they fill out the, the honeycomb cell and then they get capped. The cell gets capped by, uh, by nurse bees and they um, spend some time changing from basically a fat white grub into a, an adult bee. And they start out white. First, their eyeballs tend to get more of a purplish red color. And then you can see the rest of their body takes on the color of a new honeybee. And after 21 days, a worker bee is born. Queens only take 16 days and drones take 24 days from egg to hatching. And the honeybees are adorable. You can actually see uh, the fuzz on this one's eyeballs. When they first come out, they can't sting, they can't fly but they are an adult bee. They're just extremely hairy, a little fuzzy, and um, a little lighter in color than, they're, than after a few days they darken up. 
So as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the larvae, they're kind of just floating in a um, pool of royal jelly, which is um, food that um, is extruded from the nurse bee's heads. Bees, when they are born, as they age, they, they have different jobs. And one of the first jobs they have to do is to clean out their cell. I mean, wouldn't that be great if kids just came out and was able to clean up everything? Well, that's what any bees do. They clean out their cell so it's ready for a queen to lay another egg in it. And then they, they start taking care of the other young larvae. And they do that by eating um, a lot of the pollen that has been brought in and stored. And they use that pollen protein to make royal jelly out of two glands. One gland in their head is called the hypopharyngeal gland and one around their, their, their jaw is the mandibular gland. And it secretes the, the substance. It, it almost envisions like it's like having yogurt coming out of your ears, but it's not because um, bees don't have ears. But it comes out of these two glands and is deposited into cells. And for th the first three days of life, all young larvae get this. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna be a worker bee, which is the, the majority of bees are worker bees or a drone, then you get switched over to honey and bee bread, which is basically a pollen mixture. So only the queen or queen larvae and the, and the queen adult eats royal jelly her entire life. She's very special. We'll talk about her later. Let's first focus on the worker bee, which is, is the bulk of the hive is made up of, of worker bees. They are all female and they do all the work in the hive. The drones only have one task, which we'll get into. You can probably think what it might be. And they do it with as much zeal and zest as they can, but the, work, the workers do everything else. She literally works herself to death and we'll go into the various jobs she has. In the summertime, it's it's a lot shorter lifespan because um, at the, the second part of her life, she goes out as a forager to look for nectar or pollen or water or plant resins, which which I'll talk about later. And she can only leave, live about six to eight weeks. That's not too long. In the wintertime, like now, the bees, uh, since they don't have to go out and forage, are pretty much just staying inside in their in their hive box, trying to stay warm. They'll live live, live several months. Uh, but uh, any of the warm weather weather bees, they uh, the workers uh, only live six to eight weeks. And as I mentioned, their first chore after they clean out their cell is to become a nurse bee, and that's to feed the larvae and keep it at its proper temperature. Developing larvae have to um, develop around, I think it's 94 degrees Fahrenheit, it's something in the 90s, to develop properly. So during the warm months, now right now they're not raising much brood, but they might raise, raise a little bit right now. But during the warm, during the cold months, they have to vibrate their uh, wing muscles um, to keep the brood warm. And during the, the cool months, they, they fan them to stay cool enough. They don't wanna overheat them. So um, the nurse bees are help with the temperature regulation of the brood. And another thing they do is, is they help turn the nectar into honey. Because when a forager bee goes out and, and gets nectar, it, it, it stores that nectar in, in its crop. It's uh, called a honey stomach. I envision it, it's like having a shop right bag internally. <laughs> you go out um, and, and it's not going through its digestive tract. It's like right before the digestive tract. The forager bee comes back and offloads that nectar it's called a process called trophallaxis, which is basically mouth to mouth um, and gives it to a receiver bee, which is still an, an indoor bee. And then that bee takes it to um, a certain area of the colony where it puts it into the cell, a uh, honeycomb cell. Now, nectar typically is about 80% 80 water, 8-0 and 20% sugars. Honey is almost the opposite. Honey is more like 18% water and 82% sugars. So it really has to be um, concentrated down. And not only is does the water have to be evaporated off of it through a fanning motion with their wings and heat, but there are also many wonderful enzymes that the honey puts into, that the bees put into the honey. And that's where, how the honey not only 
tastes delicious, but it, it has a lot of medicinal qualities because it brings the pH level it down. There's some natural hydrogen peroxide in the honey and um, it's truly antimicrobial. No bacteria, fungus, or virus can live in honey because of its traits. So another job, as I mentioned there, is that uh, an, an indoor bee can be a receiver bee and, and help bring the nectar in, not only in, but evaporate it, adding enzymes. And then when that honey is just right, it's, it's moisture level is just right, those um, honey, that honeycomb with the honey in is then capped with bat wax. So it's like preserved that way. And that's the reason why they, they make all this honey because the whole colony is needs that food reserve to, to overwinter. Because right now there's nothing out there from the forage. So they're, they're eating the preserved food, a, a, AKA honey. Some of the other chores that they do, uh, the first one is clean out their old cell, own cell. As they develop a little bit, they start to create wax and you can see in the upper left corner here, the underside of this bee, she has a couple wax flakes coming out of um, two of her wax glands. Uh, that those uh, wax flakes will be then taken by man the mandibles or the jaws of the bees and transformed into nice, new, clean white wax that can be used for honey storage as well as for brood rearing. Uh, another job a worker bee could have is they could be an undertaker bee. Down in the lower left, you see some bees pulling out a dead bee. Bees are extremely fastidious. They, anything that drops, say I open up a hive and I'm, I'm do, inspecting a colony and a leaf or some grass falls into it. If I don't pull it out, they'll pull it out for me or for themselves. They do not like any foreign objects in their colony. They don't even go to the bathroom in their colony. If they, once they, if they have to defecate, they fly out, defecate and come back in. The only one who can is the queen. She, everything, they remove any of her um, waste. In the winter time when it's cold because they won't come out much more before 50 degrees, maybe a little cooler. Uh, but if they, they, they will hold it in. They will hold it in for weeks. And then on a nice, cool, a nice, slightly warm winter day, they'll come out, swar uh, circle in front of the hive, release their waste. I can envision they're all going, ah, they feel so much better. And then back in they go. But they're very clean creatures. As I mentioned earlier, they will keep the colony warm in, on these cool months by vibrating their wing muscles. They pack away the food, the honey and the pollen and the honeycombs, and they will fan in the summertime. Um, in the summer, you'll see them along the front of the, the beehive facing um, and away from the hive and fanning their wings. And it's basically just pulling cool, cooler air in from the outside up into the hive. A couple other things they do is, is they build the honeycomb. And the honeycomb is basically a, a wall of wax with hexagonal tubes coming out from each side. It's really an ingenious design. It's, it creates the most amount of um, holding volume capacity with the least amount of material. And they're, and they're slightly slanted upwards, the honeycomb, so that the nectar and honey doesn't drip out. It's just amazing. I'm an engineer by degree, and I'm just amazed by the way they create the honeycomb. Uh, they also guard the colony, usually in the front of a, a a colony, you might see a few guard bees near the entrance. They almost look like this little one in the lower right uh, with their front legs up. Um, and they also they make sure that any bee that comes in is from their colony because each colony has its own smell, let's say. Um, and they, they don't like the way, if they know th this other bees from a different colony, they will not let them in or her in, excuse me unless she comes with a load of pollen or nectar then they might let them in because it's like it's like it's like going to a party you weren't invited to but you're bringing a bunch of cookies or a case of beer or whatever they might let you in anyway the yeah. bees will do that and they also have a um a way to here that you can see their abdomens are, are are pointing up in the air and that's um kind of like a homing pheromone say i catch a swarm and I put it in a new um, hive body, uh, the bees will come out and say, okay, they'll, they'll, they'll put their little um, 
abdomen is up in the air and release a pheromone to tell others that we're from that colony. This is our new home. Come on down. And this is the karate pose of the, uh, the guard bee. Now let's talk a little about the queen. Here we have a picture of a queen. She has a number 40 on her. She's not born that way. <laughs> we as beekeepers can mark our queens if we want to. Usually we mark her with a, a dot of color. This one is obviously was from a, a queen rearing person. It's a person who actually rears queens to sell to other beekeepers for whatever reason. Um, but notice all of the bees that are surrounding her pointing in towards her. That is her retinue or her uh, the, the bees in waiting, like a ladies in waiting, whatever you want to call them. But we call them the queen retinue and they take care of her every need. The queen is essentially an egg laying machine. She's not like sitting on the throne telling everybody what to do. As long as she's laying eggs to the satisfactory of the colony, she's safe. But as she gets older, they will commit matricide and kill her and develop a new queen. So, um, but while she's alive and very fertile and, and laying her, her eggs, they take care of her in every need. They feed her, they keep her the right temperature, they take away her waste. Um, and she exudes a, a pheromone, it's called the, the, the queen substance or the queen mandibular pheromone, mandibular pheromone, there are different words, but basically it's, it's an odor that well, when she's young and fertile, um, this odor is transferred first by the people, the uh, usually through antennae action uh, from the, the ones bees that are closest to her. And then it gets transferred to the bees throughout the hive. So the whole colony knows that they have a queen. If I remove a queen, that colony will know probably within a few hours that she's gone. That pheromone is so important to them. So sometimes queens die. A, a, a beekeeper can accidentally kill a queen through an inspection. Because granted, there's anywhere from, say, 20 to 80,000 bees in a colony, depending on the time of year. Like right now, it's low. But it's going to ramp up to 60 to 80,000 come May. And it's not always easy to find a queen with all those bees walking around. So a, a beekeeper can accidentally kill her, kill their queen. The queen could die from illness. The queen could be getting old, and the um, the bees want a new young queen. Or a colony can swarm, which is not a bad thing. It's actually a healthy thing, where the old queen go leaves, takes half of the um, hunt, her workers with them, and a new queen needs to be created to um, take over the the original spot. So. The question people say, well, how, how do they choose a new queen? How's that happen? Well, when bees know they are going to, they want a new queen, basically, they know they're going to swarm, half is going to swarm, or their old queen's getting old, they're going to kill them off. Or even if I accidentally killed a queen, they choose some very young larvae and start feeding them only royal jelly after day three. Remember, I told you all larvae gets, um, world jelly, the first three days of life, if a queen happens to die, they will choose several of those very young larvae and continue feeding the royal jelly. And the cell that she's in will be extra large because she's a larger bee. She has a much longer abdomen than the workers and the drones even. So it almost looks like a peanut hanging off the side of the honeycomb as opposed to it being flat. The, the, Regular workers develop just in a flat a cell that just has a flat cap on. These look like peanuts hanging off. And it's strange, even though she's a large bee, she only takes, takes 16 days to mature, as opposed to a worker, which takes 21, or a drone, male bee, takes 24. And a lot, pretty much, it has to do with the fact that she's fed royal jelly her whole life, which is like a superfood for bees. Here's the interesting thing. Remember how I mentioned that the queen has a straight stinger where all the workers have barbed stingers? This is why. Often uh, when uh, a colony is, 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 has decided to make a new queen, they don't just do make one new queen, they make several because you know in nature, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So they make several, but are there the developing several? So um, they're all around the same age because they start developing them around the, at the same time. But the first one out 
And this is all in the dark now. Remember, the colony is in a, a dark, the high body is, is, is dark inside. There's no, no light. The first one out, she starts to make a piping noise. It kind of sounds like this. And she doesn't wake, make it with her mouth. She makes it with her uh, actually wing muscles as well. It's like she's a twitch. She kind of twitches and it makes a sound. The other queens in that are still in their queen cells pipe back at her. They call it, it's called tooting. So you have a boop, toot, boop, toot. And she is locating these other queens because of they're calling her back. And as she gets to finds one, she will slightly open up the cell and sting it and she will kill her her competition so the first one out kills the rest of them in their cells on occasion two may come out at the same time and they basically have a wrestling match and a stinging wrestling match and one dies and the victor takes over it's rough in there <laughs> okay so once she um once there's one queen, there are a few occasions where you can have two queens in the hive, but the majority of the time, there's one queen. After that, she kind of gets used to her, 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 the colony in the hive, and within a few days, she goes out for a mating flight. Now, when she goes out, um, it'll occur one or one, maybe two days. She flies into an area that's called. Um, drone congregation areas and that's where the the male bees are hanging out and this is their one and only job they're looking for any virgin queens that might be flying past and when they do they zoom after her like a comet it's actually called a drone comet you have this female virgin queen flying and a whole mess of drones coming after her and she mates with not just one we hope she mates with at least a dozen or more because in a in a beehive, the more genetic diversity you have, just like diversity in nature, even in the in in the beehive, the colony itself is stronger if it has a lot of different genetics. Because if she mated with one drone, maybe he was kind of a dud when it came to a certain disease. He was more susceptible to a certain bee disease because there are many bee diseases than all of her offspring have a good chance of being susceptible to that disease. So she mates with many, many drones. She actually only keeps a little bit of um, semen from each drone. And when a drone mates with her flying, it takes about five seconds and his genetic material is pushed into her. He falls off backwards and dies with a smile on his face, <laughs> let's say. So um, on, on most drones, only about 10% of the drones actually leave uh, life in that way. Most do not get the chance to mate, but those that do, that's, that's their fate. When she comes back after her mating flights, she returns to the hive, and that's where she stays the rest of her life to lay eggs, unless the colony swarms. But if the colony doesn't swarm, that's it. She, her, she's collected all of the, the genetic material from drones that she needs for the rest of her life in those one or two mating flights. And she will lay up to 1,500 eggs a day. Let that sink in. 1,500 eggs a day. Now, that's not every day. Like right now, the queens aren't laying that much. But when they start ramping up for the spring, say into March, late February into March, April, they're going to be cranking out a thousand, a queen will crank out a thousand to fifteen hundred eggs a day. And then she'll slow down near the end of summer because you don't need as big a colony to go into winter. And as I mentioned, the uh, she's well taken care of as long as she's young, fertile and laying those eggs. Interestingly, queens can live about three years. Historically, it's two to five. And unfortunately, it's been less through problems that bees have encountered. Queens tend to live more like one, two to three years. You very rarely see a five-year queen. Historically, there have been. But still, even if they live two to three years, that's far, far longer than the workers. So they live pretty long compared to other the other bees. 
in their colony. So uh, as I mentioned that you can see the um, royal jelly, if you're looking up into, this is a, called a queen cell. There's a queen larvae in there. It hasn't been capped yet, so they're still feeding it. And it's just swimming in a pool of uh, royal jelly, which she gets her first, uh, her entire life. And for any of you chemists out there, I had one person ask me, well, what, what's royal jelly made of? So here you go. It's mostly two thirds water, but it does have a lot of protein and amino acids, a little bit of fatty acids, monosaccharides, and some trace minerals and vitamins, which it's really much more um, nutritious food than just um, pollen or nectar alone. Here's a nice picture of a queen hatching. She hatches uh, you know, upside down. And when queens are hatching, from say April to June, that usually means one thing to a beekeeper, swarms. Swarms are great. Swarms are very gentle. They are usually planned ahead. What's happened means, what that means is your colony has overwintered successfully. It's um, led by a fertile queen. There are good resources coming in now in say April, May. So think of the, the colony as one super organism instead of, instead of reproduction on an individual scale, it's, it's an entire colony splitting into two. So the old queen will stop laying eggs. She'll actually slim down a little bit. She gets put on a diet because a queen that's really laying is too heavy to fly. Um, and she will take half of the, uh, she'll go out and, and half of the uh, colony will go with her. Meanwhile, the colony is uh, making new queens. You'll see during swarm season, a beekeeper might see many queen cells in their hive knowing, okay, they're going to swarm. So there are things we can do to try to mitigate swarms, which I'm not going to go into right now. Um, but as you can see me petting that swarm in the middle, they're very gentle. You can, now you're not going to whack, whack it back and forth, but you can slowly pet them. And it feels kind of like a fuzzy, it feels like a purring cat. It's, 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 it vibrates and it's warm and they're very gentle. So never be scared of swarms. It's not like those old cartoons where you see like swarms of bees coming after. They're not going to do that. They go out and they bivouac for a, a little while, usually not too far from their original hive body. And um, they will stay there while, while scout bees go out and look for a permanent home. And or I see as beekeeper sees them and then I can catch them and hive them up and make a new colony out of them. And they will stay in that bivouac anywhere from a couple hours to a couple days. So even if you see a swarm, it's illegal to kill honeybees in New Jersey. Uh, even if you call an exterminator, say, nope, nope, nope. You have to get a uh, beekeeper to come and, and collect them. By the time the beekeeper gets there, if it's a nice sunny day, the swarm might have already moved. They might have found a hollow tree to go into, hopefully not between people's walls. That's why I try to mitigate swarms because I have condominiums behind me and I live in a neighborhood. I don't want them to set up in someone's walls. Um, but they don't stay there that long. So the old queen leaves and the new queen stays. Half the bees go with the old queen. Oh, before they even leave, they fill up on honey because they have to be prepared to start making honeycomb in their new home, wherever that be. Uh, you know, a uh, a hole in a in an old growth old tree. That's so why I leave up those skags and stuff like that. You want to those those areas that are you know have open cavities and, and old trees. That's great for feral honeybees, but they need to um, fill up on honey before they leave, so they can start making beeswax when they find their new home. And as I mentioned earlier, sure, the scout bees are looking for a new home, and once they get there, they start to make honeycomb and make a new colony. So that, most of those chores I mentioned, except for the swarming, were indoor bee chores. And I can tell when a bee has not flown yet, because if I pull up a, a frame of bees, um, the ones that have flown usually at rest, their, their wings are, are at a, in a V shape, where the ones that haven't um, flown yet, their, their wings are still tight across their back. So usually about halfway in their lifetime, we're talking um, bees that are born in the summertime. After about three or four weeks, they start to um, go outside and collect uh, forage. And they can collect for nectar, pollen, water, as well as uh, plant resins that they make into a substance called propolis. And propolis, kind of think of it, propolis is like caulking material, like you would caulk around your windows and doors. They use that to seal any cracks in their hives. And, um, it's also a highly uh, medicinal 
um, in, in the wild, the inside of like logs up in or holes in trees where there's honeycomb, um, that area is, ha has an envelope of propolis and that's really a micro antimicrobial helps keep the, the colony healthy. So here we're, we're seeing pollen. And as you look, pollen comes in different colors. Most people think of yellow, which is almost a white yellow. Here's yellow, yeah, more of a true yellow. Um, down in the bottom left, you can see this pollen. This is a caryopteris plant, which is a great late summer blooming plant for bees. It almost has a blue-black pollen. There's red pollens, green pollens, brown pollens, orange pollens, all sorts of stuff. It is their source of protein to feed their larvae. Okay, and here, as you can tell, they, they are collecting nectar. The, the open comb, it has not, it's not quite at the honey stage yet. And the comb that looks like it has almost like a white wax paper on top, underneath that is uh, nectar that has been trans changed into honey. And that is the carbohydrate of their diet. Now, bees have an interesting way to convey information. Um, in fact, and remember this, this is done in the dark. They're not seeing this. When a honeybee uh, finds a, a new area of, um, so let's say, flowers, foraging material, she comes back and she wants to convey this information to her sisters so more go out to collect. Um, what she will do is she will dance on the face of the honeycomb and she'll dance in a figure eight pattern with like the waggle part coming up the center of the figure eight and then she'll turn and go around and waggle up again. It's called a waggle dance and turn and go around again. Um, the degree of how she waggles on the comb, like if she went, if she waggles straight up and down on the comb, that means fly directly to the sun. In this example here, She's, uh, oh, it looks like it might be about 30, 40 degree angle from the sun. That means, that tells her sisters, when you come out, fly at a 40 degree angle based on where the sun is right now. And that'll tell you what direction to go. The length of her waggle will tell her, them how far it is. The vigorousness of her waggle will tell them how good a quantity it is. And then as she comes in, she will have some smells to, to give them an idea what actually it is, what it smells like, what the flower is. Um, so it's just fascinating how they can convey all this information in one little dance to their sisters to tell them where to go for whatever they found. And sometimes it's kind of fun to pull up a, a frame of um, bees and you see the waggle dance happening because sometimes they, they dance really, they're very frenetic, and that means it must be a great source of, of foraging material. They get really excited. Okay, it's time to talk about the males, and the males occur with drones, called drones, and the drones uh, in this lower picture, you can see there's a queen over on the left. She's pointed down. She has a yellow spot on her, so look how long her abdomen is. The bulk of the bees also on here are workers, except for kind of the one little, little right of center. That is a drone. He drones are, are bigger than than workers, not as not as large as a queen. They're a little boxier. They kind of have more of a boxy, uh, blunted built, and they have large eyes. And that's to see virgin queens with. Queens themselves have the smallest eyes because remember they spend most of the time in the in the hive. Uh, it words dark, uh, but the drones have very very large eyes. They have good receptor cells to um, locate queens and they only have one job and that's to mate, mate with a queen that's out on a mating uh, flight and they they the other bees their sisters feed them take care of them um but you know it is an important job it's a way for the genetic material of that colony to get spread out to other other queens so they don't do any collection pollen pollen or nectar collection, they don't do any hive work. Um, and as I mentioned, they are the biggest honeybee outside of the queen. They're, they're bigger than the workers and they have no stinger. You can, um, I, I don't, I don't uh, say you should abuse a drone by any means, but you can, you know, pester a drone and he can't, he can't do anything to you. And I showed you where the drone was in that picture. 
So a lot of people ask me, uh, Gene, how do you get bees? How do you get honeybees? Well, there's a couple ways. You can get them um, in a package of bees. This is a truckload of packages. Uh, they usually come up in April. The honeybee propagation state on the east, east coast is Georgia. Um, and what you get is this, uh, this, this box that has a roughly um, three pounds of bees, which is about, about 10,000. So they can, it's like, a, it's like a mini swarm. So they can be bought. They are usually ordered ahead of time. Um, you can buy them online. You, some beekeepers come, go down and pick them up from Georgia, bring them up. And uh, there's another way, and that's called buying them in nukes, which is like a mini hive in itself. It already has five frames of honeycomb in with bees and a queen. They're a little more expensive, but they are, are maybe two to three weeks further along in the process. So you, uh, with the bees and the packages here, they have to make their own honeycomb once you install them. Um, and, uh, this here was a truckload of 505 packages. I helped to distribute them to people. When you walk here, it's, it's all warm because of all the, the heat that they generate. And that was about a little over 5 million bees in that flatbread truck. So it, that's a fun day to distribute packages to people. It's usually in April. Now, parts of a hive, um, Okay, I'll go down here. I might actually show you a model that I have. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll show you at the end if I can think of it. But parts of a hive is uh, we have, they're called, the first you have on the bottom is called the, the bottom board. Makes sense. And that's where bees come in and out. This actually looks like the back of it. You can't see the entrance there. Then on top of that, you will have um, uh, various hive, wood, wooden hive bodies. The bottom one here, you can see, is a little deeper than the, painted ones on top of it. That's called a deep super. We don't call them bee boxes, we call them supers. So if you hear me say super, just think it's a box. The deep supers is usually where you have the brood nest with the queen and the nurse bees and all the young larvae. And often they will be made up of two deeps, okay? This one's just one right now. On top are called honey supers. Uh, or medium supers. And this is usually where the bees will store their honey. And if you know any beekeepers, you will see their, the size of the hives change throughout the year. Uh, right now, they're not so big because they're overwintering. But then in spring uh, and summer, you'll start seeing these honey supers going on top because that's where the bees are storing their excess honey. Um, and then on the very top, you have an inner cover and an outer cover. Um, and that protects the hive. The beekeeper, him or herself, has a few tools. Um, they have a hat and veil. It can be a combo. I have actually like a hoodie veil, not like that. But it's just to protect from, um, from stings, obviously. And then you have your hive tool, which you'll see later. It looks like a little mini crowbar. And that is actually the very most important uh, tool that a beekeeper has. I have gone into my colonies without a veil. Now, usually I wear one, and most of the time I will. But there are times when if you're doing something minor, the weather's great, you might not even need that. And I have gone into my hives without using my smoker. But I have never gone into a hive without a hive tool. And that's because as bees, bees will stick together the various hive bodies and the frames in between or in inside will be stuck together with that propolis, that caulking type material, that natural caulking material. So you need the hive tool to be able to move things out. You might notice this beekeeper here is not wearing gloves. Well, this beekeeper is wearing gloves. This is how I beekeep, no gloves. Because if you squish, wear heavy leather gloves and you squish the bees, you can't feel them underneath your gloves while you're pulling up frames. That will, um, you'll get an alarm pheromone and the other bees will say, hey, our sister was killed. And they'll start singing you. So it's really a goal. Of, it really should be a goal of all beekeepers to um, beekeep without wearing gloves because then you can feel the bees and you don't squish them. You also wear a light color, not dark colors. Bees don't like dark colors. We're not sure why. We think maybe they think of it as a black bear. Dark color is not good. Light colors are fine. So don't be like this beekeeper 
on the left, be more like the one on the right. If you ever become a beekeeper, here's the hive tool. Not that exotic. It looks like it has a little hook on the bottom here. You can't see it, but it's basically used to um, pull the, uh, pop the frames from touching each other. The frames here that are light colored, those are just new frames. They just were installed recently. The ones that are dark, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just older frames, but you can see they've been used for a while. Most hive bodies have 10 frames. Some don't, but most have 10 frames. This here, uh, if you look at this frame of bees, you can see on the top where it's, there's a white area, that is honey. And in the middle where you see kind of brown capping, that's the brood. The capping, the brownish is capped brood. That means it's pupa underneath. And where you can see in the middle where it has not been capped yet, that's still the larvae that's being fed. So as a beekeeper, when you pull up a frame of bees, you gotta determine, okay, is this honey? Is this brood? Is this honey and brood? And usually the pollen, which you can't see, is in between. So this is both this is a, a brood frame that has honey around it. That, so uh, they don't have to go far to go get some honey to feed the bees. Going to give you a second. Anybody see the queen? Take a good look. Here she is. She's down in the lower right corner. Oh, she's a beauty. That's a beautiful looking queen. Look how long she is. <laughs> this here is a frame of... Honey, this is what you would pull out to extract the honey from. And you, these are all my honey, honeys I had one year. Same bees, same place, different uh, time of year. This is my spring honey, summer honey, and fall honey. Your nectar, color, and flavor is created by the flowers that are blooming at that time. So my, my spring flowers, and this is typical in New Jersey, your spring flower, at least up here, your spring flowers tend to produce a light honey, your summer flowers, a traditional honey color, and your fall flowers, a darker honey. And then you have um, varietal honeys. Some people uh, like tulip poplar honey or blueberry honey. Those are honeys that are primarily just the nectar from those plants. How do we get the honey out of the colony? Well, we pull the honey frames out that are filled and are capped. And then there are many different tools we can that you can use. This is a, one of my favorite uncapping tools because I don't need to use any heat. I also have a hot knife tool that I use heat, but I like this better. So what, what you do is you, on one side of the frame, you scrape off the cappings. You turn it onto the other side of the frame, scrape off that cappings. And um, then you'll put, then I put it in an extractor, which I borrow from our club. Now we're only, honey, beekeepers are only taking excess honey. You don't take all the honey from the hive or from the colonies because they'd starve in the winter. So each colony has at least 60 pounds left on it in the fall. And in New Jersey, an average amount is to get about 40 pounds off, excess 40 pounds off of a colony. It really depends. I had a colony this year that gave me almost 150 pounds and I had one, and on average, I got 75 pounds of colonies this year. It was a good year and it just depends on the, the nectar flows. So um, once they're spun out and the honey is spun out and you just take, put the, uh, the spun out frames back in the, uh, on the colony, if, if you're planning to, for them to uh, fill them up again, it depends on the time of year. So here's an extractor, uh, it's, it's running, uh, but it can hold several frames at a time. It spins and, and the, the force flings the honey out to the sides, comes down to the bottom, drips out of a valve onto the top of a bucket that has a filter on it and away you go. Then the bucket also has a, can have a valve on the bottom and then you can bottle it up. So this is essentially raw honey. It hasn't been heated, just straight out of the comb just slightly filtered. So some of the hive products you probably can figure out are honey. And honey is not only a sweetener, but it has been scientifically proven. This is definitely science, I'm not, not anecdotal, um, it, as a cough suppressant and the wound or burn care. Allergies, that's up in the air. There hasn't been science to prove it, but I know many people that swear by it helps them. I can't say yes or no. Uh, it's helped me, but I, I can't say it yes or no for everybody. Uh, beeswax for candles, cosmetics, arts and, arts and crafts, furniture polish, 
In fact, that's the main reason why the colonists brought honeybees. Honeybees were not in, in America until the, around 1640 when the colonists in Jamestown brought them over. And they brought them over primarily for beeswax to make candles to light at night because there was certainly wasn't electricity back then. Our native bees did all the pollination prior to that. A couple other things that uh, bees make or collect that people use is the pollen themselves. Uh, people um, will eat it as a pollen-rich substitute as a protein-rich substitute. Uh, allergies, that is not scientifically proven, but it's plausible. Of course, pollination services. One third of what you eat is pollinated by a bee. Probably higher if you're a vegetarian. Propolis, this is that sticky substance. I, I told you that they kind of stick between the walls and the frames. It's really uh, tree resins, but it's resins from tree buds. Uh, it has, it's in some areas, I was in Thailand last year. Uh, actually, I went with the University of Florida to learn about uh, five types of honeybees over there. They use it in uh, some uh, dental. I brought back a dental spray, toothpaste, some medical um, uh, items, the royal jelly I mentioned that uh, they, and I have question marks behind ones that have not been scientifically proven, but are anecdotal. Uh, royal jelly also, again, uh, it's been used in nutritional substance, substance and possibly anti-aging cosmetics. Again, anecdotal, not positively proven. Now, this is true. Venom. This is a venom, um, an, a way to collect venom from bees. You put it in on front of the entrance. It gives them a temporary shock so that they will sting, release venom, but they don't lose their stinger. It doesn't kill them. And then that venom goes on a glass plate underneath. There's it, it flakes, it, it, it hardens and you, it flakes off. And this it has been used under doctor's care to treat people who really truly suffer from honeybee uh, allergies, which is only about two to 3% of the population. If you swell up, that's not, a, that's not a, an allergy, that's a reaction. And then of course there's mead, one of the oldest alcoholic beverages for humans, which is essentially a honey, fermented honey product. So winter time, like now, what's happening? The queen and her workers are clustered up during the winter, staying warm. The drones, if you were not one of the lucky 10% drones to die after mating, well, I guess lucky, it depends on your point of view, you will be evicted by all your sisters in the fall. Because the drones are a liability in the hive during the winter, all they will do is eat food. They will do nothing else. The, their sisters evict them um, a, a cold, as things get cold, like in October, you'll start seeing dead drones that are out in front of the hive. Now drones compose just a, a fraction of the hive, way less than 10%, probably more like two to 5% of the colony, up to 10% during mating time. But um, they get kicked, they get barricaded out by their sisters. So they, they die by the cold or starvation. And then new drones will be made the following year, oh, I forgot to tell you, that new drones are made because the queen can determine whether or not she wants to fertilize an egg or not fertilize an egg. A fertilized egg turns into a female bee. An unfertilized egg turns into a male bee. And she can tell by the size of the comb if a slightly larger comb is for a male bee. And the colony creates these slightly larger honeycombs, usually in the spring, and then she'll start uh, depositing unfertilized eggs would develop into new drones for the spring for mating. So as I mentioned, they stay warm by clustering together and vibrate. The queen will stop laying eggs for a little while because uh, she does, you do lose some bees during the winter, but she doesn't have to crank out the, the number like she wouldn't during the warmer months. And I mentioned that no, none of the bees defecate in the hive. They'll have to hold it in. And on those warmer winter days, they come out. It's called cleansing flights is the proper term for when they, they go out and release their waste. It's called a cleansing flight. That sounds better. Uh, bees do have diseases and pests. I'm not going to go into all this um, in detail, but they they are number one threat for, as a beekeeper is what's called a varroa mite. Think of it like a deer tick and it transmits diseases. There's nothing you as non-beekeepers can do, but... Um, that's something of we beekeepers uh, can deal with. But you, on the other hand, can help by doing things like planting nectar and pollen gardens. And think of plants, 
that plant plant things that will bloom in succession. Don't think about plants that just bloom in the summer. Maple trees are fantastic early pollen sources for um, bees. Like and think trees and shrubs, not just like flowering annuals and perennials. Um, goldenrod in the fall, uh, uh, caryopteris shrubs. There's all all sorts of. I th look, think more of the shoulder season plants because that's that's when uh, bees need it most. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but you know, try not to pollute. Um, be careful with pesticides uh, and, and fungicides because bee bread is a fungal reaction a good fungal reaction uh, between pollen and nectar to create bee bread. And we, we think that fungicides might harm them as well. And bees also tend to pick up powders very well. So if your insecticide is powdery, they will accidentally think that's pollen and bring that back. So powdered pesticides are the worst. And if you have to uh, put it on, you know, try to do it at nighttime when bees aren't out. Uh, some people call them weeds. I call them for food for my uh, bees, dandelions, uh, clover, let them grow in your yards. Uh, your yard doesn't have to, in fact, really, if they don't, it's a, it's a green wasteland. So let your clover dandelions bloom. These are some fun things to do with bees. I have yet to get a bee beard that's on my bucket list, but I do like to be in the 4-H fairs and be in the bee booth and show people bees. So as cute as a puppy, yes, I am. <laughs> and that is my honeybee and beekeeping talk. I hope you enjoyed it. If there's I questions, did. Elliot or Dylan, I did, I'm yes. happy to address them. We do have questions for you, um, Jean. And I did enjoy that very much. I just got stuck getting my camera back on. Um, <laughs> are there... Are there other insects that cohabitate symbiotically or otherwise in beehives? Uh, no, there are pests in beehives. There are things called small hive beetles and wax moths um, that are, are pests to a bee. But I have to say small hive beetles are really nature's um, like, okay, for example, if a colony lived in a tree, okay, and that colony died out for some reason, or it swarmed and the new queen couldn't take over. You have all this old honeycomb in the tree. The, the wax moths would eat up that honeycomb, kind of clean it up. So then a new bee feral colony could take over. So in other words, uh, wax moths in nature um, provide a good service, but in a managed hive where you want it to always have a colony of bees in, they are not good, but there is no, there, no, there is no other insect that I can think of that lives in a colony of bees that the bees would want it there. <laughs> okay. Good Dylan, question, why though. We, what, why don't we um, switch, switch off to doing quest, fielding questions? Yeah. Uh, on the subject of things that live in hives that are not bees, uh, if a colony has been, uh, has been infected by mites, is the honey bee uh, bad, or, or, or is the honey bad, or the beehive bad? Is no, the, hun the, honey's, honey? the honey's fine. Um, all, all colonies, be, be they feral or managed, will get mites. It, uh, the mites are not native to Western honeybees. They came, they came from the Eastern honeybee in the 1980s, and the Eastern honeybee can... Or it's called Apis serrana. They can tolerate mites better. They they have more defense mechanisms that Western honeybees don't. So it will not affect the honey, but it will kill the bees eventually. It doesn't kill them outright. It's like getting a deer tick bite on you. A deer tick bite itself won't kill you. Well, Lyme disease won't usually kill you either. But pretend it was a disease that could tr it, it weakens you. So the viruses that get spread through these mite bites weaken a colony and eventually due to its weakness it can fail and other stressors thrown in with uh lack of foraging they aren't they aren't able to roll with them as well if they are a weakened colony so um and, and mites okay. are there that's one thing as a beekeeper we have to monitor and and correctly treat our mites 
because if we don't, our, our colonies will die. That's just the way it is. It wasn't that way 40 years ago. Before the introduction of the Roe and White, it was not that as hard. Um, how does weather and climate affect honey yield? That's a good question. Uh, well, um, in one way, the warmer the climate, as, as long as if you have more foraging material, it helps. Um, but it really just depends on how it affects the foraging material. Like I know maples don't do quite as well as they used to because it's getting warmer and maples are a really good pollen plant for bees. So it really just helps. It can, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the foraging material. It really. So it's good for the flowers or good for the honey yield. Yeah. And, and, and not all flowers make honey. For example, like forsythia, there's no nectar in them. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if forsythias are having a great year. They are totally uh, aesthetically looking plant. They have no pollen or nectar at all. Um, and what about rain, precipitation? Um, as long as we have usually good spring rains, we're okay. Because a lot of the, the trees and the perennials with deeper ro roots, they can continue to flourish even if you have a, a slight dry spell. So if you, as long as you have a good normal precipitation in the spring, early summer, um, you're fine. If, it, it, the problem is you do have these deluges sometime instead of a nice even rain, you know, with climate sure. change. As long as you have a nice, the, your normal precipitation, not just deluges, in the spring and early summer, you're okay. You can get over the hump of the dearth and the, but we haven't really had much dearth the past couple of years. Our, our August have not been too bad. Right. That's kind of a follow on to Elliot's question. Uh, do bees uh, forage when it's raining or if the temperature gets to be too high, is there a maximum limit to what the bees are willing to withstand? You guys got great that? questions. You're excellent questions. I'm impressed. Well, it's not they, us, it's our audience. Your, uh, great questions. Bees only forage when it's sunny or at least there's some blue sky. It can be partly sunny because remember the waggle dance? They have to know where the sun is in relation to where to go and fly off to get some foraging material. Now, they can see an ultraviolet band that the sun gives. It actually gives 90 degree angle from the sun, way the sun goes. So it doesn't have to be a clear blue sky as long as they can see pockets of um, blue where this either the sun or this this band that we can't see, they can forage. Um, they do. They, they will forage very close to your house, maybe on a cloudy day. They usually go up to three miles away to forage. They go pretty far, sometimes five miles, but the closer it is, the better, of course, because you don't want to go as far. So on a very cloudy day, they are, you'll have very less foragers out. You'll have a few out, but not as many. Rainy days, they're not gonna go out foraging. Uh, temperature wise, our native bumblebee goes out much earlier than honeybee that our bumblebee is a great bee. It will go out as early as 38 degrees, as long as there's something out there, like they weren't out today because there's nothing out there, even though it was above 38, uh, honeybees won't go out till it's like 50, 55. Um, so it needs to be a certain temperature and at least some peaks of blue sky to forage. Good well, question on the subject of weather. Is there a particular weather condition that is better for collecting honey for bees? Better I guess, for I guess the question would be what are the optimal conditions for bees to I guess maximize honey yield and production? Uh, it's 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 all it's all based on the foraging material you have around you. Um, like for example, if you are in an area, I'm very lucky because I'm in a suburban area where there are a lot of things blooming at different times. If I was on a farm and I put uh, like my honeybee in, in an orchard and that's all that's around me, that's great while the orchard flowers are blooming, but when the orchard flowers are not blooming, there might not be much. So it really all depends on the diversity and the amount of foraging material you have around you. Um, so what, 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 which plants make the best and which plants make the worst tasting honey? Well, or is it all is, subjective? Taste is subjective, Elliot. Yes. Yeah. Um, taste is subjective. Now, uh, people traditionally 
most honey, if you bought if you bought honey at the stores, you 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 it's it's more of a clover based honey. Clover mm-hmm. tends to be the, the base flower, but um, you know some people like um, tulip poplar honey. Some people like buckwheat honey. That's a very dark, rich honey. It's almost almost molassy like. Um, so it's very subjective. Um, even this year, have you heard of the spotted lantern fly? No, <laughs> of course. Are you are you of kidding course. me? Okay, yeah. okay. Just want to make sure. And they um, the spotted lantern fly produce uh, it's it's honeydew it's waste is very sugary and bees are taking to it and honey can be partly made from spotted lanternfly waste it's called honeydew honey um and it 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 creates kind of a redder murkier honey and uh i'm sure some of my fall honey it tends to be produced more in the fall. I am sure some of my fall honey has a little bit of that in it. Now it's probably still mostly nectar, but um, some people love it. Um, It's fine, doesn't bother me, but it's it's a subjective thing. It's kind of hard for me to say what's the best honey. Sure, sure. (laughs) Uh, What are some good native plants to plant for pollinators, especially bees in, you know, for example, small gardens like you'd find on a windowsill Hmm. uh, in urban areas? Well, I have, if I can find this, I have a, um, my favorite beekeeping plants. It's like four quick slides if you want to see them. Um, the, they aren't all native, I have to say. Some are and some aren't. Um, as long as you're not invasive. No. Oh, bite your tongue. <laughs> they are not. So let me... Pop this up. Okay, well, you're going to see them not in full screen, but this is my um, my winter favorite ones. Maples. Maples, maples, maples. Can't get enough of them. Silver and then red. The silver bloom first, the red bloom second. Uh, winter aconites. Those are little tiny, uh, and these are all deer resistant unless I tell you otherwise. Uh, hellebores. They are actually native of Turkey, but they are blooming. I'm having some blooming right now. Snowdrops, crocuses. Crocuses are not deer resistant, though. Um, spring and early summer. Alliums. Alliums are ornamental um, onions. Deer mm-hmm. don't like them because they're un- they kind of look like Dr. Seuss plants. They have a long. The giant ones are great. They have a long stem with like a pom pom of little flowers on top. Uh, hollies. American holly. Okay, that's native. So you're saying that we can both promote pollinators and also get a healthy crop of onions and garlics? <laughs> yeah, they, well, I, it, when you it, when they pollinate the, the flowers on the onion and garlic, actually, you, you really the, your crops, you really don't want them to bloom. You want to take off those scapes. Uh, th- these are alliums. These are ornamental. These are flowers. Your onions and garlic, you want to cut those scapes off so the energy doesn't go into the flower, but goes down into the onion or garlic bulb. So not quite. Uh, boxwoods, lamium, ajuga, cherry trees, not the double blooms, crab apples, red buds. That's, that's a, red buds are definitely a, a native. That's a good uh, plant. Uh, lavender, cat mint, mountain mint is probably the best um, pollinator plant in the Penn State trials. I think that is a native plant. It, it's like, it's like the Star Wars bar scene. You have all sorts of bees, native wasps, um, butterflies, uh, serpent flies. That is like the, my favorite perennial uh, called mountain mint. And that's a summer plant. And then the last one, you have your asters and goldenrod. Those are native wood, uh, wood ast- white wood asters and goldenrod. And uh, caryopteris, which is a blue, called a blue misspiria, but it's really not. It's, it's a blue flowering bush. And calamintha almost looks like baby's breath. Those are late summer, early fall plants that that I like. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, do colonies ever raid or fight each other? Yes, they will rob each other for um, honey, their honey supplies. And it's usually a strong one will go after a weak one. Uh, like yellow jackets will go after a weak one. There are things we can do as beekeepers, pretty much reduce the entrance of our weaker colony 
to so the, so the guard bees only have a tiny area to guard off as opposed to a whole open area. So there are things we can do to try to prevent that. But yes, strong and this will this tends this will not occur when there's a lot of foraging material out there for them to get. This will occur during dearths when things when the flowers have shut down. You were mentioning about temperatures. A lot of flowers will stop producing plants will stop producing flowers when it gets really hot, like over 85, 90 degrees. Um, so if you have a dearth and there's not a lot out there, yeah, then you, you can have robbing occur. Uh, do you recommend planting vegetables and allowing them to flower to feed bees? It seems like that would be a good filler for- I think it's- uh, sometimes. Uh, they, like your vegetable garden is going to give them some forager material. It's not giving them a lot. Remember, they go out three miles and they need a lot, a lot of nectar. Remember, the nectar coming in is 80% water, 80% water. And that gets crunched down to 18% water. I'm not saying don't plant a garden. Go ahead. But even my 2.2 acres I have, my bees are getting most of their foraging material not from my yard, even though it has a lot of stuff. They're going way out, three miles out and about. So it's not going to hurt. It's not going to make a huge difference if you're collecting honey, but it's certainly not going to hurt. If anything, the bees are going to help your plants yield better because of the pollination than the plants helping the bees take in nectar. So you said that bees can go up to three miles mm -hmm. to forage for pollen. Um, and nectar. And nectar. Do you ever see towns take stances against people uh, keeping bees because of possible safety concerns? Great question. And yes, historically, there have been. There have been some municipalities that did because unfortunately, just like in life, there are some beekeepers that don't beekeep in a responsible manner. But now New Jersey has... Um, regulations for beekeepers, such as um, keeping water on your property so they don't go into your neighbor's pool for water, um, how many colonies you need you can have per size property, um, how far off of a like a sidewalk you should have. And now you can keep bees anywhere in New Jersey as long as you're a responsible beekeeper and do it the way you're supposed to. So there really aren't, to my, to my knowledge, any more restrictions of where, I mean, there are bees kept in, in cities in New Jersey. There are bees kept in New York City on, on rooftops. It's not just a rural thing. I'm in the suburb. I know two beekeepers, other beekeepers within a mile of me. I know probably 10 within six miles of me. There are a lot of us. <laughs> um, Gene, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a, a list of several um, Northern New Jersey Highlands trees, na um, um, native trees. And can you tell me good, better, best as po their role as pollinators? I'll try. I can, I can know of a few, like a tulip poplar is awesome. Okay. What about maple? Or awesome. Fantastic. Any of the maples. Birch. Birch may give you some pollen, but not nectar. Okay. Oak. Pollen, but not nectar. Chestnut. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't I know them all. I don't know. I don't, I don't think anyone will know the answer to that one because uh, black, black locust is a good one. Black locust is an excellent nectar tree. Uh, basswood or linden. I'm not sure if that's native or not. And how about hickory? I don't know. I'd have to look at the flowers. Usually, like, like you know how oak and birch have kind of a cat, cat skin? They don't mm -hmm. really have, like, a flower. That's mm -hmm. why they're more pollen. If, if I don't know what a chestnut reproductive organ looks like. If it's more like a flower, it, it probably is good. Like, like a tulip tree is a huge... Uh, um... I would guess yes. If it's looking yeah. like... If it looks like a tulip poplar flower, yep. I would guess yep. yes. Okay. Any more questions, Dylan? Uh, I have one more question here. Uh, how do you tell what plants your bees are getting nectar and pollen from? Is there like a taste test or something? No, uh, not exactly. Um, I can tell sometimes by the color of the pollen. For example, um, 
Red dead nettle called lamion has a, a, a reddish pollen, so I can see them bring it in. I can see a goldenrod pollen has a certain color. Um, so as if, yeah, if some, and if I know certain things are blooming and I see the bees going to it and I see them actually on that flower with the pollen packet on, because if they have a pollen on, pollen on their legs, it's called a corbicula where they hold it, they're going to the same type of flower usually that day. It's not like they're going to a tulip tree and then to a crab apple tree and then to whatever. They usually focus on, there's called floral fidelity. So often I will look at a, a bee on a particular flower and look at the pollen on it. So I can kind of say, oh, that's a, uh, that's the color for boxwood pollen. You kind of have to train yourself. There's, to my knowledge, I don't know if there's a particular book on it, but there probably there might be. But uh, yeah, you kind of have to train yourself. So if I go to a, a specialist honey shop that has a hundred different kinds of honey, if they label that as, you know, maple honey or mountain mint honey, would they be reasonably confident that that's actually from those plants? Buyer beware. <laughs> because well, um, if you remember, they go three miles. So like, for example, if you're a blue, if you pollinate blueberries and you stick them in a blueberry acreage, more than likely the honey that that comes off of that during that time will be mostly blueberry but it's like organic honey there probably nothing exists unless you own three miles in a whole circle that's a lot of acreage and can guarantee no pesticides are on it that it's organic you're not going to find that in new jersey too much many places. Um, but there are varietal honeys. And yeah, that you have to have those colonies in a large patch of purely lavender, purely whatever, maple. Um, you can get it tested, but it's kind of expensive. I, I think one of the schools in Texas used to test it. Um, but yeah, uh, down you can get citrus honey down in um, Florida. Tupelo honey, which is very expensive in the in the southeast, and it may not be a hundred percent of that nectar, but it's the it, I think it has to be a certain percentage of that nectar to be called that varietal. Well, Trader Joe's has a honey sampler pack that's seasonal, mm -hmm. and there are about eight different honeys per flowers, probably coming from all over the world. You Could know, be. I mean, Trader Joe's does import a lot of stuff, and everyone's a different color. They all have different tastes. They're, it's sort of cool. Um, it is cool. I love tasting. When I tr I do a lot of traveling, and when I that's one of the things I bring back and definitely taste. Mm. My favorite honeys are from Central America. I love the tropical flavor honeys, but it's, that's just a personal taste. Is, is honey grated like maple syrup is? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, not it it can be it can be yeah i like i i don't mine's not graded per se but yeah it, it can be yeah it, i don't think it does it's quite as as i'm not quite sure i'm not sure if it's as quite as uh, definitive as the maple syrup but i have heard of different grades and when we do in honey uh contests like at the, the far at the 4h fairs and various places you'll see honey contests we get graded on it i've centered them many times and we get graded on a, a variety of elements Taste is only a tiny portion of it, though, because mm. it can vary so much depending on what flowers right. they went to. Well, thank you so much, Jean. This has been um, very interesting and a lively conversation afterwards, which I appreciate. And Jean uh, should be coming back to do a separate webinar for us at some point, uh, talking more about New Jersey's native bee populations and getting into the, the nitty gritty of the different types of forest bees you'd be likely to encounter maybe out of the beehive. So, uh, Gene, thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Uh, you've been extremely informative, and uh, I am sure that all of our attendees feel the same way. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Dylan. Okay. See you all. Thanks.